the way I think we should have fun. You can open up your booklet. You have most of the PowerPoints. You'll notice we'll shuffle them a little bit. I keep an eye on my audience because if you don't turn a page, obviously you are not listening closely as far as that goes. And when we jump around a little bit, we'll see if you can keep up with me and go with that as well. Does anybody not have a booklet? Because they're $10 now, $10 now. Oh, we're going to pass them out. Very good. Okay, well, let's get going. And, and certainly, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, we didn't, uh, Liz and I agree that this might be one of the topics to discuss. And that is kind of where we are and things, as uh, Dr. Hatcher points out, are a little tough in the dairy area right now as we look at this. So things are really changing uh, in the dairy sector, in the cropping sector, uh, just all over farm size. Uh, boy, I tell you, you saw the headlines, Wisconsin loses, uh, uh, you know, 500 dairy farms here, you know, in, in one month. And so it can really have impact as we go along. So certainly things change. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the, this is not all good news, but we will get to good news. Certainly, we look at the class three price December. Uh, and and uh, the good news is it's looking to go up a buck to buck and a half by the end of 2020. They promised that to me or 2019, they promised that last year as well, and some of you folks would smile. Uh, amazing, butterfat now, look at that, $2.51 a pound, and basically every, every, the whole world wants butterfat, which is good news for your dairymen because it used to be five or 10 years ago, that was bad news, you're all gonna die using that product as far as that goes. Milk protein, $1.14. I'll bet somebody here a piece of pie, if you look at me, I don't lose many pie bets, milk protein will come back. Milk protein will come back. So you Jersey guys, hang in there. Hang in there. Milk protein will come back because that is, I will argue, that's what the world is going to want. Animal protein. Animal protein. What concerns me, in, it concerns me is that with this high butterfat test, some of my producers are going to shift their genetic program to higher milk fat components. The other one is interesting, Illinois, our major co-op, Prairie Farms, we're under a quota starting October 2017. And our, so those shippers are under, under a quota right now. And that has some very interesting ramifications. We are down now 4% milk in Illinois. And basically, guys and gals, it's bad news. Certainly, we know heifers are, are, are going to be very, very uh, inexpensive at this point. In fact, we heard some buying that $800. Go down to Missouri, you get them for $800 a throw. We also know that cull cow prices have gone down, and we also know bull calves are worth about $50, and heifer calves are worth what? Less. Less than $50. Did you ever think you'd see that where a heifer calf, a uh, Holstein or Jersey heifer calf, would be worth less than a bull calf? And so people have gone to what? Some beef crossing. I don't know if some of you Jersey folks are doing that or not, but we'll talk about that here briefly as well. There used to be other alternative sources in terms of getting income from, uh, for our dairy farms. Well, here she is. There's your world record cow. Our students at Illinois said, well, you know, this dairy industry and you grad students here from ten Tennessee are saying, well, this is, a, this is a mature industry. Look at this cow. This cow made 78,000 pounds of milk. Well, the national average is 22,000 if you're looking at Holsteins, as far as that goes. Look at this dude here, 3,000 pounds of fat, 23 pounds of protein. That's really strong components. I just got an email from the owner last week, and guess what? She made another record, finishing at 73,000 pounds of milk after this one right here. So this cow is still alive, still kicking up in Wisconsin, and pretty amazing. And the question is, you know, this cow probably made us some money even with today's milk prices out there as well. So you always got to be willing to change. Look ahead. Hopefully I can challenge you here in the next few minutes on that as well. I, too, have to change. For example, uh, uh, looking at what's going on here, uh, politically speaking, uh, my Jersey cow had a change and I had a change. Any, got any Jersey people here? That, that, that's the new look. That's the new look. Uh, and so you got to always be ready to change. Be ready to go as far as that goes. And that's as far as I'm going. That looks, yeah, I, right, I, we'll move on. The word is I look more like Rush Limbaugh, but we'll leave that alone as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll move on from there. So be ready for change. And so here's my theme for you today. And that is when you look at your glass of milk, do you see it half full or half empty? And my challenge the next 40 minutes is to fill your glass with milk. So I think there's some real opportunities. So we got about three or four options that we're gonna talk about that you can take a look at and say, can I put more milk in my glass in 2019. So here are some of the ways that you and I are gonna talk about for filling your milk glass. 
Let's get started and let's go. We'll stop after each option. We'll see if you have any questions. We have a few minutes of extra time. So if you have a question, raise it. This is your meeting. It's not my meeting. And my goal is to give you one idea to go home back to your farms or your clients and say, maybe we should try this. Maybe this will work on our farm or it may work in Illinois, but by George is not gonna work in Tennessee and that's another answer as well. So here's my first option. Let's go ahead and build that milk check. And let me tell you, my farmers under quarter Illinois are really looking at this one, and that is certainly ways and, and ways of increasing milk components. And even though these prices are modest here, you Jersey folks are looking at a lot more than $14 milk. I know that. A lot higher price from there as well. Certainly, we also get premiums from our co-op this last month, 83 cents in Illinois. We put on top of that. So if I can get 37, 38, 39 butterfat on my Holsteins, I can put money on that. And we are still getting a BST premium Illinois. Uh, it's right on their milk check, and I'm not quite sure where it's coming from, but it's there typically in the range of 35 to 40 cents a hundred. And let me tell you today, if I can find you 25 cents a hundred, we just made a lot of money at this meeting here. So let's go and see if we can find that quarter as we go through it. I think the first question, and that is, well, what's normal? What's typical? So this comes from the August uh, 2019 Horge Dairyman, that great research journal that you and I read all the time. And here it sits, my Holsteins, that is normal. 3.8, protein 3.06. Here's my Jersey breeders. You can see their components down here as well. Now what are you gonna do, who? What are you gonna do? Well, first of all, the question is, are you there? Second of all, if you divide the fat into the protein, that's 80% for Holsteins. What's your number? Then get out your records. Take a look at your second, first lactation, second and third lactation cows, in the first 60 days in milk, and the last 100 days in milk. And I'll bet you a piece of pie, that number's changing. And if that's number changing, that means what? You got an opportunity. Why are those numbers changing out there as well? The breed that changed this last year are these Holstein crooks right there. That number used to be three, had been 3.7 for the last five years. And last year, it's 3.8. Where's my Holstein guys here? How many have higher butterfat tests? Higher butterfat tests this year than last year. And I see a number of hands going up here. So we're seeing even more milk fat here. And I don't know if that's because of higher forages, better forage uh, digestion, added fast to the ration. There could be a couple of reasons why that butterfat test is going up. But I almost guess in, in 2019, when this comes out, this will be 3.9. Jersey folks aren't changing too much. You're picking up a little bit on the protein end. I think in the long run, that's going to be good news as well. So the question is, what's your percentages? The only way you can make any money today is to go home and look at my po points and say, you know what, Martha? Or John, we're gonna check this out. We wanna see, in fact, if we're meeting that. Now this is our goal in Illinois, and I think it'll work in Tennessee as well, and that is basically we'll look at pounds because we're paid for pounds of fat and pounds of protein, and you'll hear, basically, here's the five pound rule. Hopefully every Holstein and Jersey breeder is averaging five pounds of fat and protein. You just gotta be there, because that's what's driving my milk check at this stage of the game. The goal, I have a show of hands, but that, uh, we, we'll, we'll delay that. I think your goal is gonna be six pounds. You're gonna be at six pounds. So I think that's another goal. So that's another question for 2019. Where will, this, where will your herd be in terms of pounds of product, pounds of solid out here in the program? Now here's some brand new data we just got from the North Carolina Processing Center. And I'm pretty sure your records go there as well as ours. And that is, I asked uh, uh, them to look at uh, Holstein components. By the way, we have Jersey data as well. And if you want that, let Liz know, and I can forward that to her. But what they did for me is they looked at different lactations, one, two, and three. Then we looked at different levels of milk production. 19,000, here's your average, 23,000. And this is what really drove it. I needed data on 30,000 pound herds for Holstein because farmers are coming to meetings and said, Hutchins, you always talk about 22,000 pound herds and we're averaging 26,000 pounds of milk. And so you can see that's what we did here. So we have the same data here for, for Jersey as well. Look at this guys and gals. Look over here in the first 40 days and, 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 and these herds that are at state average, for example, or national average, look at the butterfat test, three, four. That number should be what? 3.6, 3.7, 3.8. 
Yeah. It's, so do you ever look in the first 40 days on your DHI report and see what those components look like? Now you come down here to the, to, to the, the, the herd down here, uh, you know, the high herds, and you can see the higher herds are generating higher numbers. In fact, you can see, the, isn't this interesting? And you can see this data. This comes from 292 herds, so it's a big data set. Big data set. And you can see that my high herds on component-wise did what? Better than lower producing herds. And we say, you know, I got high producing cows, they just can't give me components. Now here's your wake-up call. Look over here on protein, folks. Look, these are all green, which means what? They're all below the Holstein breed average in the first 100 days. So I don't know if that's dry matter intake or that's transition program or amino acid balancing. All I know is in the first 100 days, all these Holstein herds, and you can look at the bottom here, we're talking thousands and thousands of herd. The protein really suffers in the first 100 days. Where are you at? Where are you at? Because there's what? Money laying on the table depending on where your numbers might be. That's it on option one. Any questions or comments on milk components? Feeding the inert fats can raise the butterfat test. According to Michigan State, the magic number is, if you're paying more than $1,100 for that fat product, you can't get your money back. That's Adam Locke's number. So it says, how much can I afford to pay for Megalac or Energy Booster or Palm Oil or the Palm 80, whatever number you have there, that's kind of the magic number. Now that looks at milk fat increase response. Doesn't talk about reproduction, doesn't talk about fertility. It simply says that's the economics on it. And boy, if there's a time to talk economics, now is the time to take a look at that. Any questions or comments on that? Move on to option number two. I call it marginal dry matter intake. Now, some of you are going to have to go home and report to your spouse or your wife or your girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever you happen to have. Hopefully, you don't have all four of them. But anyway, we'll move on. Is, is this picking up okay? Can you hear me back there? Must be a group of Republicans that are really quiet. We move on. Marginal dry matter intake. What is marginal dry matter intake? And for me, marginal dry matter intake is that last pound of dry matter your cow consumes, and if she understands the research, if she reads the books, she'll produce two pounds Jersey milk, two and a half pounds of Holstein milk more. Because remember that last pound, we already paid her maintenance requirement uh, for keeping herself warm today, for walking around, replacing a body tissue. She, she's paid all those taxes. So that last pound go right to milk production. In fact, that was a whole story behind RBST, because RBST basically segmented nutrients to the mammary gland for milk production. So in Illinois, that's going to cost me 10 cents a pound. More about that a bit later. Every one of you should know that price right now. What does it cost to put a pound of dry matter in front of your Holstein jerseys or other breed cows here in Tennessee? If I get two pounds of milk at 15 cents a pound, that means I put a dime in, I got 30 cents back, and so I'm Dutch. Anybody here Dutch? You got Dutch background, boy, they're, they're tight. They, Dutch people are really a bunch of tight people. They'll squeeze a penny twice. Anyway, 20 cents profit. I'll take that all day. A dime in, 20 cents back. So the question is, can you get that last pound of dry matter in? So the question you should ask, well, well why do my cows stop eating dry matter? So I'd like to share this slide from the University of Wisconsin published in the Journal of Animal Science a number of years ago by Dave Mertens. For some of you in the crowd who will recognize that name, he said there's three reasons why your Jersey or Holstein cow stops eating. The first one simply says it's an environmental situation. It has nothing to do with the co-op's ration. It just says the bunk is empty. You're at a meeting here in Murfreesboro and the feed bunk is empty. And that good cow, she couldn't eat any more if she wanted to. A better example would be heat stress. Make sense? The other big one, and that's a whole other talk for another day, lameness. I think that's going to be a huge factor in the future in our U.S. dairy industry because our consumers are going to be all over that lameness situation. And then they're going to go to something, a place like McDonald's and say, if you buy milk from a farm that has lame cows, we're not going to come by and buy our lattes there anymore. Mm, think about that a little bit. 
So certainly that's, that's one potential block. Uh, sand free stalls would be another example. Cow comfort. And, uh, and the list goes on and on from there. Uh, Jeffrey Bielow can give you a whole talk on that one as well. Number two is something tells a cow to stop eating. She's absorbing and she's her body monitors that and basically it shuts her down. A good the, the one we know best about is fat feeding. If you get more than seven to eight percent fat in the diet, your cow eats less of it because the cow's system says that's too much lipid in the bloodstream. We're going to shut her down. I wonder about rumen pH. Some of you know Mike Allen up at Michigan State. It's called the hot theory, propionic acid. A lot of propionic acid coming out of the rumen. Will milk you rid nitrogen? I wonder about that. Could milk you rid nitrogen be a factor that tells your cow to stop eating? And our number is what? Under 12. Under 12. We won't get there today, but that's our tool. It says if you're over 12 mercury and nitrogen, you're kind of in no man's land in terms of efficiency, reproduction, and, and maybe uh, appetite consumption. Now, I can see some of you are really struggling with this concept. I can see it in your eyes. Okay, let me do a quick survey. Anybody here besides me like peanut M&Ms? Who likes peanut M&M's? Show of hands. Okay. All 10, 12 of you. When you leave here tomorrow, stop at the store and buy the, that big yellow two-pound bag and put that right next to you in the car, and you start eating that as you drive home. If you've got more than 60 or 70 miles, you can really pack her away. Let me tell you. That's a, a voice of experience there. I will bet you that around a pound and a quarter, your body is going to tell you what? Stop eating peanut M&M's. Little beads of perspiration will come on your forehead. You get unusual feelings in your body. Six hours later, be close to the bathroom. Make sure the door is open because something else is going to be happening as well. So certainly th th that's a feedback mechanism. So a lot of you can relate to that. I can see that right now. But that's why the co-op and feed companies, consultants, and veterinarians build rations. Adjust the levels of starch and fibers and proteins and amino acids because they're saying we're trying to make sure to remove that block. The third one is the new kid on the block. And that basically, I say new because now we have a new tool. You'll see it here in just a minute. And that's room and fill. It simply says, physically, she can't eat anymore. And that's why those Holstein cows eat 10 or 12 pounds more dry matter a day, high producing Holstein, than a high producing Jersey. Because the Jersey just physically can't eat as much. So I don't know if we're having a buffet luncheon or not, but don't let me get in front of you. Because trust me, I'm one of them big Holstein guys. You little smaller people, you, you're going to have challenges as far as that goes. So that's called physical feedback. So your job today is saying, do I meet the requirement of dry matter? That marginal milk. Get that extra mouthful into that cow. Does it work? So that's kind of a fun PowerPoint that uh, Rick Grant sent to me. And basically, we got that wonderful room inside that cow. And those of you in the front row can see it better in the back row. That'll teach you to sit way back there. But here you can see the rumen. And she's eating here today. And eventually, that rumen is filled up. And then, of course, she digests that feed. And eventually, it clears down. Why is that important? Well, if I'm a Holstein cow producing 80 pounds of milk, I've got to be eating over 52, 53 pounds of dry matter. Tomorrow, I have to eat what? 52, 53 pounds of dry matter. This has got to get out of the way. But I still have to extract the nutrients from that, and that's kind of the story. So here are the two tools you want to go home with tonight. Write them down. You heard this one before, neutral detergent fiber digestibility. It's an index of dry matter intake. Bingo. There's that magic word again, dry matter intake. And this is the classic study from Michigan State that shows that if I, for every one unit in forage NDF improvement, higher quality forages, that's going to end up with about a quarter of a pound more dry matter, and that is about half a pound more, 4% fat corrected milk. There's that feed efficiency coming into play as well. So the question is, where is your NDFs? And now in your booklet, you've got a chart to go home with. So it says, how many here are uh, feeding corn sides? Where are my corn sides, folks? Well, lots of hands going up. you got a 60. Do you have your NDF digestibility, and that would be right that up there on the top, should have been there. That's 48 hours. There's several different tests on your sheet, as you'll see here in just a minute. That's 48 hours, and a 60 is a really good one. That would be a good one. So are you on my chart? Any BMR guys here in Brown Midrib? Got some BMR corn silage? Oh, a couple hands going up. You're going to be over here. Should be 71. Because it's lower in what? Lignant. 
Anybody here raising alfalfa? Where's my alfalfa, alfalfa grower? has got a few hands going up. What's the new kid on the block in alfalfa? Low lignin alfalfa. Who's got some in the ground right now? Who's got her planted? No hands go up. I want some of you to try it next year. See how you get along with it. We don't have a lot of data yet on it, but it's lower by about 10 to 15% in lignin. That's something, you should you try the whole farm? I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't go the whole farm, but I get some experience with it out there as well when you go out there in the program. So you can see alfalfa, you can see if I go to my uh, legume hay and, and hay here, you can look at 46 versus 60. Do you think that's huge? And NDF digestibility, it is huge. And that's why we in Illinois suggest what? Two thirds of the four dry matter is going to be what? Corn silage. I'm gonna ride that all the way to the bank. So that's another question we'll talk about right at the end of my talk. Do you have the right ratios of forages on your farm based on growing conditions, topography, soils, and other factors as well? So another assignment, first assignment was what? Look at those components. Second assignment is where's your NDFD looking at? Now here's a new kid on the block. How many heard of UNDF? Who's heard of UNDF? Great, we've got some hands going. UNDF is undigestible NDF. It's kind of the reciprocal of it, but now I want you to go home and do what? I want you to calculate how many pounds of forage UNDF you're feeding today. Maybe in March you open up a new bag or bunker, you get to a different crop. Certainly sometime next spring you're gonna get a new crop. And the question is, this is my best guess. Notice the word, my best guess because I always give my dairy farmers numbers. You can't say, well, I want a high number. Well, what in the world is high? Holstein, somewhere around five and a half pounds of UNDF 30. And that 30 is important because there's a different number up there. So make sure I want you to calculate the number because sometime you're gonna change forages and that number is gonna either go up or go down. And I'll tell you, your cows are gonna talk to you. Your cows are going to tell you something. New Jersey folks, I'm sitting around four pounds of UNDF 30 from forages. Well, there's other, uh, you, you, other fibers, that you, UNDF fibers in the ration. I don't know what to do with them yet. Research still isn't there. Uh, fuzzy cotton seeds, soy hulls, citrus pulp, they all have UNDF. They have much higher digestibilities, but they'll have lower UNDFs. And we know that the physical, now we know from Minard Institute, the form of the UNDF, meaning, is he chopped it this short? Can he chopped it this long? Or even longer? Also makes a difference on fill factor. This is, this is the fill factor. This is a fill factor. And so that number comes from Rick Grant right there. 3.4% of the cow's body weight. So again, if you've got big Holsteins or small jerseys, you can work her backwards and forwards. Just calculate the numbers. Because I'll bet you a piece of pie, you've got the percent UDF in that forage crop on your report but the lab has no idea how much you're feeding. Only your nutritionists and only your consultants can do that. And I think that's a useful number to have because forages is so important on intake and fill factors and digestibility as well. And here's a fun one to look at. This comes from Cumberland Valley. That's a lab over in Maryland. Some of you may test there. And this looks at the percent UDF of the dry matter in that forage. And here's BMR, and this is 2018 data. Hey guys, this is new, yeah, this is new stuff. Here's BMR, now you wanna go this direction because it means faster digestibility, less fill factors. You Jersey folks, and some of you participated in our big Jersey survey that we did at U of I here about a year and a half ago, and about, it looks like about a third of the Jersey farmers were feeding BMR. How do we know that? Because we saw the forage test results. We could see it was BMR, but that's why you, here's BMR, here's the rest of the corn silage, here sits my legumes over here, and you can see they're, they're sitting somewhere around 21, 22%. Here sits my grasses, and, and the good news on the grass and the bad news is it can really suck, but it can be very, very good. And now we're seeing, at least in the Midwest, more grass coming in with alfalfas or bring grass in with our alfalfa for a couple of different reasons. We can argue about that a bit later. So the question is, understand this chart. Because depending on which, leg, which forage crop you're using changes 
the potential of intake and dry matter in when you've got good cows. And I keep emphasizing good cows because they do what? They make you the most money. Brown cows, spotted cows, black cows, pink cows, whatever color you want, good cows make money. They make money. And some of you are going to say, but Hutchins, that's part of the problem, Hutchins. You want me to make more milk for my cows' answers. That is correct. Because I can't stop those crooks in New Zealand. What's happening right now in New Zealand? They're up 8% in milk. 8% in milk production in New Zealand because it rained. And they also discovered something called palm kernel feed and, and corn silage. And so they're getting a lot of milk out of that island. And what does that mean? Well, it means China now goes to New Zealand and gets their milk. There's no need to come to the US, especially with our politics where they sit right now. So certainly New Zealand isn't helping us. And the US, the good news, 40,000 fewer cows this last month in the United States. What's the bad news? We're still up 1.5% milk. I can't control those. All you can do is control your cows on your farm. And can I position my herd, my cows, to compete with those crooks? And I think that's your half glass. If you've got that glass, you're saying, you know what, I can compete because I'm going to use some of these niches. Away we go. Away we go. That's it on dry matter intake. I think it's so critical. It's critical in dry cow rations and heifer rations, calf starter, liquid. There's, there's a whole talk on dry matter intake here for dairy farmers. If I had to give one talk and say, what's the most important thing to talk about to a dairy farmer? That is dry matter intake. Any questions, comments, arguments on what I said on dry matter? Didn't say, should have said, shouldn't have said, whatever the case is. Yes, sir. Okay, this question is what about all corn silage? You want the academic answer, you want my answer? My answer is I would not go all corn silage. I would keep a small percent, and I'm talking maybe as low as 10 or 15% of some other forage in there that's going to give you some structural, structural fiber in there. Anybody here feeding straw to the milk cows right now? Feeding straw to the milk cows? Got a couple hands going up. And what they're doing is they're adding, when you add your straw, you're adding UNDF to the ration. Now the question, how much, you, how much straw should I feed? My answer is, look at my UNDF target. And typically it's a half to one pound. It's pretty common. But I got some guys feeding two pounds last year, and now this year they're going to have poor corn silage. I understand some of you in Tennessee have a little problem making corn silage this year. If you have poor quality corn silage, you may discover that you got to take that straw out as far as that goes. Theoretically, if you chop it right and silo it right, do it right, you could go 100%. But boy, I, I'd be nervous. If I, was, if I was working with you, I'd be nervous. Or if you did it, I'd be watching you really, really carefully. Now, the other thing that's coming, you would have read it in Hort Dearman six, oh, about six issues ago, it's called Compact TMR. How many remember reading the article from Michigan, a veterinarian in Michigan on a Compact TMR? Compact TMR, they chop everything down to a quarter of an inch. And they take her up to about 40, take her down to 40% dry matter. It looks like, I've seen it in two different farms, to me it looks like wet gluten feed. Anybody ever see wet gluten feed? It looks just like wet gluten feed. And so they're arguing, and they're right. You Jersey guys know those brown cows can sort the crap out of a TMR. There is no sorting this wet feed, chop that short. I have all kinds of questions about it. Nobody's got rumination collars. Nobody. No, 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 nobody has uh, cud chewing effects and components and dry matter intakes and efficiencies. But if you're going to 100% corn silage diet, you're heading that direction. You tend to be heading that direction. That's what triggered my thought process. Nobody will ever ask another question because you can see I get off, I get off task pretty quick, kind of like the president. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. His question is, what about using some of the small grains? My favorite one is triticale. And then Illinois, the other one that's very favorite is wheat leach, winter wheat, because in the spring I can make a decision. I can take grain and straw, or I, I got choices. Or if I'm really tight on forages, it's my first crop coming in. You cut, you cut those small grain forages right. I'm talking right at the boot stage, just as the heads start to emerge. I call it poor man's corn silage. But it has a little more structure to it. It still has a little more structure to it. I'm a big fan, of course. What's the big news now? And I see our commissioner still here, and, and that is the cover crops. Lots of interest in cover crops. Why in the world in Illinois are my dairy farmers not putting cover crops and all that black ground down there? Don't understand that. 
take two crops, take it off, and I can still come into full season corn silage in, in late April, May, and get the job done. So I, I like small grain forages. Now, you chop it wrong, which means it's going to be headed out and pretty tall. Now you've got heifer feed and dry cow feed, and that's, that's fine. So do, do you do decide how you want to position. How you want, oh, I like the small grain. I like the small grain forages, especially coming through the winter because it has some other neat factors that come into play. I th the, his question is, can I replace alfalfa? My answer is yes. But I got a feeling that I know some alfalfa forage guys will go nuts with that answer up here, but I think it can. I think it can. I think it can. I think it can. Just get the right particle size on it. And, and I don't think we'll get to the particle size. We'll see how our time is going here. But anytime you go over three quarters of an inch, shorten her down. The new data says get her down because the size of a bolus. Remember, and how do you know that? The size of a bolus, your cow chews her feet. There, some university, I can't remember who it was. And that's 10 millimeters. It's coming down 10 millimeters, which is going to be about a half inch, which can be about a half inch, roughly. Maybe a little shorter than half inch. So that's how long, that, that's what she can swallow. That's the good news. So you chop shorter, she can swallow it quicker. What's the bad news? She doesn't have to chew it anymore. Less bicarb, left buffer going in the rumen. So ah, that's the big argument with the compact TMR. Because literally, it's kind of like uh, swallowing yogurt. You don't, a lot of us don't chew yogurt very much. And I got a compact TMR. I think she can just ram her home. She can just ram her home. And she can't sort it. And that's the whole theory behind the compact TMR. Where'd it come from? It's those crooks in Denmark. I don't know if there's any Danish people here, but that's where it came from. Yes, comment. Well, my opinion on chopped corn, I know the big word on shredlage. I, I think it's an interesting concept, but if you get your kernel processor set right, I don't think I need a shredlage unit because it's going to be about $30,000 per the roller versus $10,000. You're going to spend 15% more energy on it, and you're going to go slower because they can't chop as fast. And if you're a custom operator, my custom operators in the Midwest have no time to go slower. because they got three farms sitting behind them calling them every, every six hours saying, when are you coming to my farm? When are you coming to my farm? So I'm going to go, I'm going to chop, I'm going to go, I'm going to have that chopper set at three quarters of an inch. The old shredlage used to be inch and a quarter. Uh -uh. Three quarters of an inch is where I'm going to have her set at. And I'm going to have about, and it, well, we'll show you the numbers. I'll show you the number. It, it's in your booklet, believe it or not. It's in your book. So I'm looking at about 10 or 15% in the top box. The second box, about 60, 65% in the top, in the middle box. The second box down. If you got that, Bingo, I think you've got it. Shredlage, kernel processor, however you did it, whatever the setting was, you got it right. So now everyone who dairy man, you should know that number right now. What's the percent in the top box and second box in your three or four box unit? Where's my dairyman? How many own a Penn State box? How many own a Penn State box? Who owns a Penn State box here? You got one hand going up. Do you think that'd be a really good investment for about $300 if you're big enough? Or better yet, Easter's coming. Give it to your wife for Easter. That's the, her Easter or anniversary present or a birthday present. Give her a Penn State box because she doesn't have one. Second of all, she'd be speechless. She won't talk to you for about three weeks. <laughs> May not be all bad either when you think about it as far as that goes. Why do you want a Penn State box? Because now you, you, you can get that answer. Now maybe your feed co-op will do that for you. But remember, you got that big TMR mixer out running out there every day. How many think that TMR changes depending how many minutes you run that? The order you put the feed in. How far you drive it? Huge, huge. You got waybacks, right? Shouldn't have one or two percent waybacks every day. Do you ever take the Penn State box and look what the wayback looks like? Because if it varies by more than five percentage points, it's been what? It's been sorted. And you need to know that. And then also when you're chopping that small grain next spring, you're going to run that box, depending again how how big a wind roll you got and how fast you're going and how many horsepower you got and all that kind of good stuff. So I, I just think you really got to have, you just need to know that. Anything else good to cause? Yeah. Yep. Otherwise they wouldn't invite me back. How could I come back and talk if we didn't keep changing the numbers as far as that goes? But I'll bet you a piece of pie is going to keep getting shorter. 
Now, why did that start in Denmark and Germany? Because a third of their corn silage is going into biodigesters to make energy. And so they can chop their corn silage so they can sell the bad corn silage to the energy plant to make energy out of it. And so now they got two choices with the corn silage. Feed it to the cows or sell it to the energy plant and, and go that direction. So that's where it came from, to be honest with you. I think so. His question is, would it be more palatable if we chop shorter? If you make it wetter, we know it's going to be more palatable. I have no idea what would happen in Tennessee if I have this ration that's 60% water and it's 100 degrees down here with 80% humidity. I don't know what the bunk life is going to be. That's another question as far as that goes. But I think it will be, uh, be more palatable. I think it will be more pal palatable, just answer in generalities. Very good. Very good. We'll probably have a coffee break, and you two guys can go first because you ask really good questions. You know, so you can... Okay, we'll move on. I can see that didn't weigh well. Anything else for the good of the cause? We should talk about how many have shredlage? Anybody got shredlage here? Oh boy, you're not going to be a happy camper with me, are you? Shredlage will always break the kernel. That's the key. If you can bust the kernel. And if I can see a kernel or corn in your corn silage, shame on you. Crank her down. How many, how many got regular processors and replaced the rollers? Who has replaced the rollers on the processors? Good, I got some hands going, because guess what happens? Them suckers wear out. And the word on the street is buy new rollers. Don't get them reconditioned, because they can't put the same edge on them. So at least my guys I've talked to in Illinois said, buy new rollers. They can only put so many tons of silage, and they kind of wear out, kind of like your tires on your car and factors like that. Okay, moving on. Holy smokers, we're going to be okay, though. Number three, the good news is you've got two speakers covering these two. How many have looked at these two programs? Who, who's looked at these two programs? Who's going to pull the trigger? Who's going to pull the trigger? Who's going to buy one of these two programs? Well, you listen to these guys here today. We're telling our dairyman this is a no-brainer. This one's a no-brainer. I don't care if you got 2,000 cows or you got 200. You can be part of this program here. Because what happens is I can lock in at 15 cents. I can lock in in Illinois. 1750 milk. And the good news is I hope I lose my 14 cents, which means what? Price of milk's above 1750. I'll just show you this one. He, he may be showing, I don't want to say too much more, I'll get in trouble here. But basically these are these are going to be your, your values. Here's your eight dollar milk. And so you can see by and large, you're going to be looking. This is USDA. This is what they're going to be doing in the new program. Your congressman from Minnesota did a yeoman's job. I have no idea how he got the president to sign off on this deal, but the good news is your president, like your commissioner of ag, is in love with agriculture, and that's always good, that's always good news. But you can see $8, and so I'm going to go back now, and I'm going to lock in here the, uh, get my pointer here, I'm going to lock in, it's in the middle, I'm going to lock in the $9.50 plus $8, and there's my $18.50. That's class three milk. You Jersey guys are going to do what? You're going to put your components and your quality premiums on top of that. But anyway, I think you've got to look at these two programs. Brand new. This one you can't do much with now because uh, it's hung up now at the government shutdown. Mid-February, you're supposed to be making it. The last word we saw was mid-March, which implies that maybe, but I see the FSA offices are opening in Illinois. I'm not sure they're opening in Tennessee, but they are opening some of them, according to our Secretary of Ag, and I do think we've got a good one there too. Uh, Sonny uh, Purdue. We move on. Okay. Forge quality. Well, we've already touched on that. So we can go through this a little bit quicker. We've got to be done at 9.45. That's, that's quitting time. So we, uh, we honor the time. We'll switch to other topic. Forge quality. This will go quicker. Here's what you and I are looking at. When you look at forge quality, when we talked about that small grain forage question, he asked, he said, what kind of a cell wall am I going to have here? Because if that uh, uh, triticale or rye or wheat matures, what happens is the, the plant says, I've got to save the seed. Plant's got a stand, so we're going to lignify. So this brown area gets bigger, and that has a disability of what again, folks? Zero. Zero. The plant does that because it protects the seed, it protects the plant. Number two, cellulose increase. I got about a 30% digestibility. Hemicellulose increase also, that's about 80, 70% digestibility. So how this cell wall forms at your forages becomes keen, and that's what we talked about earlier. Here sits your legume grass. This is some from Dairyland Labs, a Wisconsin lab that does Midwest region, and here's their 2018 values. 
Some of you raise your hands in alfalfa. How do you match up here? So here is your, uh, here, here sits your, your, your uh, NDF. And some of you may wonder, what does this mean here? This is amylase treated, no starch and no ash. So this is a pure NDF. So you see that number goes down. So keep an eye. Some of these numbers change around. If you get their lab, they will give you this UNDF 30, UNDF 180, UNDF 240. Here's your NDF digestibility. Here's that your sugar, which may be important to some of your alfalfas and grass, especially your grasses. If you make hay out of it, you'll see sugar there. So the question is, how, how, does, this, how does this fit? How does it, here's your RFQ. Our number, we estimate, is about 95 cents a point. So if this goes up to 177, 20 points, that's worth about $18, $19 more a ton if you're going to sell it or if you're going to buy it. That program was never intended to be an economic indicator, but our farmers, everything in my talk says, show me the money. Show me the money out there in the program. So here's a nice one to take a look at at your leisure tonight. Here sits corn size from last year. Here's the average values, again, Midwest. And there sits your, your, uh, your NDF digestibilities at 30, 120, 240 hours. Here's your UNDF. So you're not a common, you're gonna find these labs have a lot of numbers on. And my bias, and it's my bias, I want this number, NDF, NDFD at 30 hours, and UNDF at, UNDF at uh, 30 hours. And there's my benchmarks. There's such your range from last year. And this is just an example here. We're going to skip now because we don't have time to show the example. Uh, this guy is a winner because he's got lower NDFs, but he's a lure because that NDF is what? Less digestible. Less digestible. So he kind of wins and he loses, kind of like our politics nowadays. I'm not sure you're going to see this here in, in Tennessee. Uh, tar spot. Anybody see tar spot here? Have heard about tar spot? Well, I'm not going to spend much time. I'm just going to show you a picture of it. Uh, big problem in the Midwest last year. And here we go. There it is. This is called tar spot. It's a fungal infection. And basically, northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin, Indiana, parts of Minnesota got hit with it. Maybe it was because of the wet rain we had. I understand you folks had rain as well. And it, it came in. It came in. And we don't know much about it. But all we know is it dropped 30 bushels per acre on good corn. And the corn plant died in August, which meant they had to chop it three or four weeks earlier because it was just dead, dead. So tar spot, it's a new kid on the block. So write that down. If you got a report home tonight, what you heard, you heard about tar spots, you heard about UNDF, and you heard about uh, dry, uh, marginal dry matter intake, and you can look at those at your leisure. I do want to cover this one. Do you realize United States, we have 20% more heifer calves than what we need? What's those heifer calves? What's gonna happen to those heifer calves, those heifers we have growing on our farms? They're all gonna what? They're gonna have a calf, aren't they? And they become what? Part of the problem, part of the problem. So the question is, is it significant? This comes from California of all places. And once you get by feed costs, the good news yours will be a little bit lower than that. Replacements are number two. If you look at a cost, enterprise cost, you can see replacements are number two right after feed. So there is a huge investment and heifers on the farm. So what are those heifers worth? Here's a study from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, 2015, and it simply shows what it costs to raise a heifer in red, milk fed or replacer fed calves, and here they got a $400 calf. Of course, now you and I would drop it down here. So if you want to take $300 off that, but the point is over $2,000 to raise a calf. And this include stanchion, free stall, and commercial growers. They sampled all three of them. The extension people went to the farm and collected the data. It wasn't just a mail-in survey. This is pretty powerful stuff. It takes a lot of time to get the data. Anybody remember for a cup of coffee at the break, what was the price heifers going for right now in the United States? 11 to $1,200. So it says you're gonna lose, invest about $900 in a heifer, hopefully, that will work out for you. So as this slide says, compared to say four or five years ago, raising heifers is not a profit center anymore. It used to be, you could raise them probably on your farm cheaper because you use family labor and you use the old chicken coop and life goes on. Not anymore, not anymore. So the question is here, number one, how many heifers do you need next year? 
and there's a spreadsheet by Zoetis and a couple other companies as well. Depends on your culling rate. You're at 40%, you need a lot more heifers if you're 30%. Death loss at heifers, calves should be under 5%, older heifers under 2%. Depends on your management skills and calving interval. Are you calving every 13 months, every 14 months, every 15 months? That makes a difference. Because you're gonna discover, in most cases, you are raising more heifers than what you need. So what are some of the tools? Get ready to vote, you Democrats, Republicans. Number one, genomics. Who's using, anybody using genomics here? Genomic testing heifers. Testing genomic heifers. Well, not too many hands going up, one or two. Why would you do that? Because my dad said, I'm never gonna sell a heifer calf because I'll sell it to a neighbor, and that damn heifer will be the best heifer on his farm. He'll come back and tell me, you sold me your best heifer. He says, I'm not gonna take that chance. We're gonna freshen them all out. Genomically, I can answer that at what age? Four to six weeks of age, I can tell with a very good confidence if that's gonna be a super heifer, an average heifer, bull average heifer. Number two, how many are using sex semen? Anybody using sex semen here? Two hands going up here. One dairyman told me a couple months ago, he said, that's the biggest problem we have. We got that damn sex semen. That's why we got all them heifer calves there. But I think it's a tremendous tool because I'm gonna genomically test my cows and my heifers, and I'm gonna use one on that, those animals. Sex semen, because I want a heifer calf out of what? My best genetics on the farm. And if you don't believe it, you say, oh, that's just, that's just for those registered guys and people in that business. Go down to North Florida, 4,000 cows. And every animal on that farm, cows and heifers, is genomically tested. That's going to cost you what? 45, 50 bucks? Versus $800 investment in feed, labor, facilities? Hmm, I'm Dutch. Got to think that one through as well. How many are producing crossbreeding of beef bulls? Anybody using beef crosses on the bottom end of the herd? Fantastic. You Jersey folks should really be raising your hand here because those dudes are worth, at least in Illinois, $150 to $200 premium right now compared to Holstein bull calves. And we all know the story on Jersey bull calves. That's not a pretty one. That's not a very pretty one. So the question is, I think you've got some tremendous tools, opportunities, and ways to calculate to maybe find, let's say you've got an extra 10 heifers. I just found you $8,000. Good meeting? I don't know. Maybe $8,000 isn't enough. We move on. You got to grow them dudes. It's in your book. We're not going to spend any time on it. Another talk for another day, but uh, young calves. Here you can see a prepubic heifers, and these are basically breeding age heifers. And you see the nutrients change. So there's some neat opportunities there as well to keep your feed costs and growth rate up. But here are my five take home messages. How many here are feeding an accelerated milk replacement milk program? How many are feeding an accelerated milk replacement program? If you aren't there, figure it out. Those animals produce, on average, 1,100 pounds more milk in the first lactation they come in. It's going to cost you $50 or $60 to buy the extra milk or milk replacer, and you're going to get an extra 1,100 pounds of milk. Think that one through. You can't go back. The problem my farmers are telling me, Mike, that $50 right now is pretty critical. I'm going to keep that $50 in my pocket because i got to pay the hoof trimmer or the veterinarian. So things are getting squeezed pretty tight, pretty hard here. How many of you need a textured calf milk replacer? Textured calf milk replacer, not pellets, textured. Could be steam flake corn, could be some pellets with protein in it, or old something like that. How many of you need textured? Textured milk replacer, uh, calf starter. The data is pretty clear. Calves do better on textured milk replacer, especially if you've got some molasses in it. Heifer's got a calf in at 23 months of age. How will you know that? Well, look in your DHI records. It's right there. The data is clear. Holstein produced more milk at 23 months of age. What surprised me in that Jersey survey, and these are Jersey surveys of about 40 of the top Jersey herds in the United States. They are also calving them at 23 months of age. I thought I'd see 21 or 22, but they're, they're going full age on those Jerseys. That surprised me. I thought they'd be younger. Measuring the growth rates for Holstein, 1.8 pounds a day from birth. From birth. Because if you don't come this fast, you can't get there. And then finally, you got to have really good health records. And I love your first presentation. It looks like you're going to get rewarded to get healthy calves. But data from Wisconsin says if you've got a calf that's got a respiratory issue, and she's a calf, you should do what? Sell her to the neighbor. Pretty good chance that's going to be a poor calf. In fact, it's pretty significant. We're on a big calf ranch, big calf ranch, and they're feeding 23,000 calves. And in the first two weeks when those calves come in from those seven or eight different farms, they determine if they're going to keep the calf. And if the calf is a poor doer, they can't get her on feed, the calf doesn't do well, we, he calls the owner up and says, come get your calf. 
or we can destroy it for you, whatever you want to do, but we're not going to raise it because we, we'll lose our shirt raising it. You're going to be happy about it, and away we go from there. Here we go. We've got four, five minutes. Hang on to your hats. Away we go. Now, this moves way back. Now, you'll discover we're going to skip about 18 PowerPoints in your handout. And some of you are moving. You're going to turn about three pages to find me, and here we go. Every year is a new year for you. I call it the Hutchins 50-35-15 rule, which means what? 50% of the rash is going to be forged, 35% is going to be concentrate, and the other 15% depends. Forge quality. NDF, UNDF. Prices of byproduct feed. Prices of grain. Right now, corn is what? Pretty economical. So ration change. Are you raising the right forages? 2018, I ran this through my computers using Spartan 3, balancing the ration for everything but minerals and vitamins, and here we go. In Illinois, and probably Tennessee, my cost here with 70% corn size and 30% alfalfa was 356. If I went to two thirds alfalfa and one third corn size, 456. Balance for everything. A buck a day laying on the table. Is that a big number? Holy smokers. A dollar a day because I fed more corn size in Illinois. So the question is do you have the right forages? And if you're thinking about small grains and winter, sil and winter silages, wow, you're with me. You're with me all the way. Here's the four numbers you got to have. Here we go. Here's the numbers I use to generate my numbers. My guess is your numbers are more expensive than mine, but that's the numbers I use. Here's my budget. Now I want to tell you, I'm, I'm lowballing you. My forages are two thirds corn silage, one third alfalfa. My byproduct is half cotton, half corn gluten. My protein supplement is half distillers, half soya. So if you're going to run with the big dogs, you're going to run with me. I'm going to play hardball with you. Here we go. Here's the four numbers you will circle on your handout. That's nine cents a pound of dry matter. There's a crook in Michigan got her down to seven cents because he got free beet pulp because they had too many sugar beets, and they gave him away. So he came. The only reason he came to dairy meat, he wanted to know how many pounds of sugar beets he could feed. We figured that out. Nine cents. Feed cost under six dollars. Income over feed cost of $16 milk, and our Holstein people are getting that with premiums now. About $10 income over feed cost, I need about $11 in Illinois, according to the farm records. And feed efficiency, this is pounds of 3.5 milk per pound dry matter, 1.6. So if you've got 1.6 over 10, or whatever you need on your farm, you should know that. What do you need to cover everything on your farm? If you're a dairy business man, lady, person, you, need no, you, you know that number. The trouble is, DFA can't make that number go up magically, and here's your feed cost per day. Here's, did you see this? If I get 80 pounds versus 70 pounds of milk, look what happens. All these numbers go south. So you say, I'm going to cut back on my cows. Feed's too expensive. Your cows are going to go south. And so you might save a nickel today, but six months from now, you're in deep, deep, deep trouble. Here's my last PowerPoint, and then we're going to we're gonna switch PowerPoints. And here's the break-even price using Sesame. Sesame is a uh, program from the Ohio State University. Anybody from Ohio here? Anybody from Ohio? There's only two good things that ever came out of Ohio. I hope you realize that. One is Sesame, and the other one's I-70. That's the only two good things that came out of uh, Ohio. Okay, we'll move on. Are you guys settling in on me? You're not, you're not laughing. You're still laughing. Hey, take a look at this. Here you can see this is the current price coming out of Wisconsin, Illinois. So these are not Tennessee numbers. There's your break-even price. So here you can see corn silage. It's a real deal. According to Dave Fisher, my colleague in agronomy, says, you guys in Illinois can produce that for about $23 a ton. You can grow it for $23 a ton. This is market price. Actually, it's a little high right now. Here's your alfalfa. That's exactly the market price. So this computer knows nothing about feeding cows. It looks at the nutrient content and says, good alfalfa is what? Too expensive. Too expensive. Crappy forage, pretty good deal. But then you and I both know what's going to happen with crappy forage. Here's the slide you want to see, and we're done. And that is here's the distillers' grains. Who's feeding distillers? Anybody feeding distillers' grains here? Well, that's a hand go. Make, keep your eyes and ears open because distillers' grains is, cheap, is changing because they're sucking the oil out. Corn oil is worth 28 cents a pound. They're going to take the oil out, which makes it less valuable to you. Boy, you beef guys go nuts on a deal like that. You want the oil. Here's corn gluten feed. That's amazing to me. Anybody feeding corn gluten here? Corn gluten? How are we doing on price? Are you, are you in this range here? Lower. What surprises me, at least in the Midwest, these two are identical. Nearly identical. 30% protein, 
six, 8% fat, 18% protein, no fat. And you're going, duh, we move on. Here you can see the, see the rest of them. Uh, Hominy is a good deal. So here, here are prices. So are you on my chart? Are you on my chart? And with that, we're done. We're done. So we're going to change. We're right at the, take quick questions. They're going to change PowerPoints on me. You might want to look at the second presentation. Any questions or comments? Something I said, didn't say, said too fast. Didn't make any sense.